Welcome to Globe Watch with me, Charles Abune, Ed from the Hilton Hotel here in Yaoundé. At least 1 trillion euros, that is the amount of money spent globally to make lives better for humanity by the European Investment Bank created in 1958. It was part of what was then the European Economic Community simply transformed today as the European Union with 27 countries after the exit of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Their focus has been described as one of the largest financial institutions in the world providing assistance in the areas of climate change, energy provision and providing medium-sized enterprises with the necessary resources to become functional and stable enterprises globally. What has been the contribution of the European Investment Bank to the global economic market? My guest today on Globe Watch is the Vice President of the institution. Thomas Upstrus, welcome to Globe Watch. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, indeed, too, as one of your mission statement indicates, the European Investment Bank is dedicated, amongst other things, to fund and assist financially in the realization of projects, quote, which cannot entirely be financed with means available within member countries. Can you unpack that for my audience? Yes, so uh, we are a rather big bank. Uh, we, uh, we are the world's largest multilateral bank uh, with the mission to have additionality in what we do. That means that we're always looking for projects where the ordinary market wouldn't support it self-evidently. We want to be additional in some way or another. And this is true both when we work inside the European Union and outside the European Union. So last year, for instance, we financed uh, 95 billion euros of projects, uh, up to 10 billion euros outside the European Union. So we are rather big both inside the European Union, but not least outside and also in Africa. So we're always looking for projects where we could be additional, have impact on economic development, on economic growth, and the well-being of people. Ever since you started in 1958, with roughly six countries of what was then the European Economic Communities established by the Rome Treaty, you have backed, supported globally, in and out of what is today the European Union, roughly 500 million people, at least 25,000 projects globally. Um, tell me, what are your core areas of intervention? So what we do is that we provide not only financial expertise, we have plenty of them, of course, economists and lawyers that knows exactly how to construct a financial deal that make it beneficial both for the client and for us. But we also have many engineer, civil engineers, medical doctors, expertise in different fields, of the economy and the society. And I think that is our strength. We can combine these types of knowledges to help all within in Europe, but also outside Europe, to develop projects. And we are very strong in climate. And we are the European Union Climate Bank. We are very strong in renewable energy, energy efficiency, these type of issues. We have also strong expertise in health. We were actually first to finance BioNTech's innovation with a vaccine against COVID-19, and then we could also see to that COVAX. Plus 200 billion euros. Yes, that, that was crucial, yeah. because they were, they were our, our client, they were doing cancer research. But when the pandemic hit, they came to us and said, we have an idea on how to develop a vaccine. And we put more money into it, and they actually, very rapidly, this small German company, developed a vaccine and now they are growing and now they are also coming to Africa for vaccine production and we go with them. We also provided almost a billion euro to COVAX for COVAX being able to buy up vaccines and distribute in Africa. So we have health also. Digital technology, we are very strong on that too. Transportation. These are some, some fields where we have very strong knowledge within the bank 
that we use when we partner up with countries. You, you pride yourself as being the financing arm of the European Union within a very large scope. And by 2030, you plan to inject at least 1 trillion euros in green finance and energy in particular. Why do you pay a lot of attention to green finance today? We think it's crucial. And we think that if we're going to be additional and have impact, I cannot think about any other issue that is as important as climate change and the fight against, cl against climate change. Because it also gives you economic development and economic growth and possible prosperity because the investment needed can also make the economies work better. So we, we put a lot of attention into that, both with expertise and with a lot of money. And when we reach one trillion of total investment, it's because we can crowd in private is, capital. Is it part of the green energy team? Of yes, energy? it's a core part of it. And when we put in money, we crowd in private money. And that is why we can reach these huge amounts. Uh, we talk about trillions. So th that is what we are. We are a crowding in bank. We try always to get private capital to come together with our capital to get the maximum uh, impact. Between 2015 and 2020, your projects were spread across the world, just like in previous years. And within that period, you impacted at least 46 million people with portable drinking water. Apart from that, what has been the other areas of minimal impact to ordinary citizens? I think uh, energy is, I mean, water is uh, key for us, uh, water and sanitation, but energy investment has also been, I think, transformative for many people's lives. Here in Cameroon, where we are now, we are now in discussion on how can we be supportive in rural electrification? Because if you want to have economic development, access to affordable elect electricity produced in a sustainable way is, I, I think, a key issue. So this is something that we're going to, going to invest in uh, going forward in many countries. Well, um, your priority area of investment is, of course, within the member states of the European Union, but you have expanded the COOP, especially since 2000 and the 2008 global economic meltdown, which restructured the way uh, 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 resources were injected to stabilize the markets. Um, Probably your investment priorities in Africa are not as the same as they are in Europe or the Middle East. What are your key development priorities in Africa for development? First of all, we want to be partners. We don't want to be coming from above. We want to have a thorough conversation with private sector and governments and authorities in different African countries to see where could we partner up. What are the where, where are, what fields are the most important in that individual country? This is how we work, and we work very closely with the European Union delegation in each and every country to see to that we can cooperate tightly on the priorities with the local authorities. So that is, I think, uh, uh, key from to start with development of agriculture, the possibility of getting credit as a smallhold farmers. We can do that by partnering up with local banks where we provide liquidity and they can provide credit to smallhold farmers that otherwise don't get it. Renewable energy and accessible and, and cheap energy comes up. Infrastructure, of course, basic infrastructure need like today in Cameroon, railway investments, but also roads uh, are on the, our agenda. So these type of investments together with health, I think health will be more, even more important going forward, not least primary health infrastructure, crowding in private capital. You are very much aware that Africa is roughly 1.3 billion people. And out of that number, roughly 600 million of them are deprived of energy to power businesses, especially in the small and medium-sized enterprises sector. What has been the work of the European Investment Bank over the years in that domain in particular? We have done a lot. Uh, we partner up uh, on these issues with uh, both public sector and private sector mm. all over Africa. But uh, much more needs to be done.
because electric Are there clear examples to illustrate that? Are you part of the INGA project, electricity in the Democratic Republic of the Congo? Are you part of energy provision resources in Nigeria, Kenya, Ethiopia? Uh, we have so many examples. We have here in Cameroon uh, hydropower projects uh, that we are engaged in. We have that also in many parts of, Yes, exactly. Okay. So we have many, many examples like that. Uh, but we need to do even more going forward. I think for many African countries, there's a, there's a great opportunity to leapfrog uh, into uh, the new world of renewable energy, uh, see to that uh, hydrogen production, using sun. Leapfrog, meaning they don't need to go through the processes that Europe and the Western world went through to uh, stabilize their energy consumption. As we have seen, uh, for instance, in the mobile uh, phone explosion all mm. over the world, mm. Africa has uh, succeeded many European countries when it comes to using digital banking, for instance. So that type of leapfrogging could also occur uh, in the energy sector, going directly towards renewable, uh, sustainable energy solutions, also thinking about how to uh, s preserve energy using, for instance, production of hydrogen being an export product uh, for many African countries produced in a green way. I mean, there, there's, there's so many possibilities coming from climate change, necessary investment, but also renewal of uh, industry. Um, let's put the European Union Investment Bank or the European Investment Bank into context in the world in which we are living today. You are operating from your headquarters, initially based in Belgium, today based in, in, in Luxembourg, with a, a, a workforce of roughly 4,000 yeah. people, nearly 4,000 people. When you look at the world today as an investment bank, what do you think are the challenges, are the main tax that development experts most? This, is, most a, this, is, a, this is a crucial issue. I think when you look at the world today, you see that uh, uh, there's not enough uh, grant support out there to really give uh, uh, the opportunities for these investments that need to come, not least in Africa. We all have, have to think about how to leverage scarce resources. And we can do that uh, via uh, European Investment Bank or any other development bank where we can, uh, for instance, the European Union give us guarantees. We can multiply the guarantee by lending much more greater sum than the guarantee cost for the European Union. Mm -hmm. We can also crowd in private capital. I think that is crucial. We will never get the investment done if we do not crowd in private capital also. Mm -hmm. And we can be a leader in that respect. Mm -hmm. If we go into an investment fund mm -hmm. that want to invest in female entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. if we do our, our, our assessment, our due diligence, and we say this is a good investment fund, then you will see private capital flow in mm. because we have done the assessment and giving it a stamp of approval. So this is how we want to work. Crowd in, we can leverage money from the European Union by being a bank, but we can also leverage by crowding in private capital. Well, you have created so many jobs over the years, 2015 to 2020, for example, nearly 4 million jobs were created the world over because of your direct and indirect uh, financial assistance, advice and whatsoever. A while ago you talked about this technological revolution, which is of course sweeping across Africa. Yeah. And most African countries have identified it as um, a great source of revenue for their young people in particular. What are you doing in assisting Africa achieve or realize the greatest benefits yeah of the digital process. So I've seen uh, now so many projects that uh, gives me very great hope that we are, if we do things right together, we can have a very good period ahead of us because African entrepreneurship is astonishing with all these bright young people with great ideas. The global digital market will be roughly $25 trillion dollars by 2025, yeah. and Africa doesn't want to be behind that track. No, and uh, Africa is very advanced in many aspects when it comes to digital, not least the global aspects of digital, and often very smart in using scarce resources to leverage them. I mean, uh, we have, uh, in my visit to Kenya just a couple of months ago, I met uh, several entrepreneurs that use money that we have invested in an investment fund, equity fund, that is in turn and invested in their companies, 
that is closely connected to mobile technology, digital technology, and where they have great plans to expand outside Kenya to conquer f more countries and uh, see to that they can uh, expand their business. So uh, equity investment and loans can provide for them the capital that they need. Oh, you realize that um, a, a, a greater chunk of the African market space is mostly supported by the private sector. You used a word earlier because of the interview that you want to work on the basis of partnership. How much do you partner with the African private sector to create sustainable jobs? And when I'm talking about sustainable jobs here, I'm talking about environmentally friendly uh, uh, jobs. We actually, our financing in Africa that varies between three to five billion euros per year uh, is basically 50-50 private sector, public sector. So I think uh, we, are, uh, we are doing great things in the private sector uh, uh, together with the European Union and partnering up with, uh, it might be private banks, it might be private equity funds, or other types of funds with thematic investments. And I think this is what we want to uh, continue with. Partner up with local financial intermediaries, investment funds or bank banks, because they have the local knowledge. And thereby, we can be supportive and give additional uh, support to the development of uh, entrepreneurs in Africa. Oh, well, you are in Cameroon. Now, let's talk about your uh, investments in Cameroon and participation in the country's economic march forward over the years. You have provided a financial portfolio of roughly 550 billion CF francs. What have been your key areas of intervention? So it has been uh, infrastructure, of course. It has been renewable energy in Archigal that we're going to uh, visit tomorrow is one of those examples. Uh, it has been, uh, like we have presented today, cooperation with local banks to support uh, private, uh, small and medium-sized businesses. And I foresee that this is the field where we go also uh, forward. For instance, when it comes to transportation, efficient, uh, affordable, and sustainable transportation in the larger cities. We are looking into projects there. What can we do to use uh, modern bus transportation to create uh, environmentally friendly uh, means of transportation for ordinary people. Electrification in the rural areas where we can uh, work together with local partners to see to that and Team Europe partners to see to that we can contribute to electrification in areas that still do not have access to sustainable and reliable electricity. These are fields that where we certainly want to go forward. One specific topic I think is important is female entrepreneurship and female uh, uh, small and medium-sized businesses to see to that we can, with our partnership with lo local banks, see to that we pr improve access to capital for, f for women that want to improve their businesses and want to put their business plan into practice. In one of the conversations, you heard one of the government or cabinet members uh, tell you that the small and medium-sized enterprises uh, make up of about 98% of the Cameroonian economy um, with a GDP sustenance of roughly 44%. Information like that, how does it shape the European Union Investment Bank attitude and policy and areas of operation in Cameroon? This is why we so often in our deals with local banks or local financial intermediaries have that as a key topic. How do we see to that our resources reaches the smallhold farmer somewhere mm. on the countryside? Yeah. And how can the That's almost the color of the Italian economy. The, yeah, yeah. the, the, the whole Italian economy is made up of small and medium-sized yeah, enterprises, yeah, yeah. <laughs> although yeah. it's industrialized. Yeah. <laughs> And, and, and that combination of having a very strong tradition of uh, uh, small companies is very good to build on. But you also have to create an environment where some of these companies grow and uh, become a, a market leader. And I think that type of development we are seeing everywhere in Africa, but we are ready to be supportive of that with the loans or the capital that can be used for realizing the business plan that many of the entrepreneurs have. Well. In a moment, the interview will be coming to an end. But permit me to tap from your personal 
uh, life experience. You used to be a Swedish member of parliament, an advisor to the minister of the economy. You were a senior card with the International Monetary Fund on economic issues, on development issues, on climate change issues. Tell me, has your personal life experiences in all those domains help you see things differently when it comes to development at the European Investment Bank? Yes, of course. Uh, maybe one of my most profound experiences is that I became minister in the Swedish government in the midst of a totally devastating economic crisis in Sweden. Our banks uh, were very close to bankrupt. We had a huge banking crisis. Unemployment exploded and uh, public budget deficits ran out of control. I was minister for 10 years. We worked very hard night and day to try to clean up the mess. And uh, I think everybody was upset with us in the beginning because we raised every tax and we cut every expenditure. But uh, when we went through that and saw some light in the tunnel and it was worth the decisions and we saw the economy coming back, and people also saw that it was worth uh, all these uh, uh, tough decisions because the economy came back again. That has affected me a lot, uh, also in my career at the International Monetary Fund or in my profession now as Vice President of the European Investment Bank. Everyone can do something to improve uh, their uh, country and especially if you have strong partners, then you can do something really, really good. I want to ask this question on energy from a global perspective because the war in Ukraine has redefined the dynamics yeah. of uh, energy sources in the world. As the European Investment Bank, when you look at what is happening in Ukraine and Russia, what lesson do you draw to make Europe uh, independent on energy issues? First of all, I must admit that I am shocked and really, really concerned by this aggressive war that uh, Russia has started uh, invading a free democratic European country. That hasn't happened since the Second World War. So this is something really, really serious. And he is also, with this action, putting a lot of countries in the world in disarray. Because his action raises food prices, his war raises petrol prices, so we have now Putin prices globally. People are suffering under this. So the first thing we would all wish for is that Putin realizes that this time is over to conquer other countries. Go back to your own country with your soldiers and food prices will come down and oil prices will come down. That's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, Europe has drawn a lesson that we cannot be reliant on uh, Russian gas or Russian basic uh, supplies because this is an aggressive nation that uh, is ready to occupy their neighbors. So we will invest even more in well, reliable... Russia can equally put it back that the European Union and NATO member countries are adopting aggressive attitudes that no. threaten its security. It's a debate that we can that hold on and on, and that, that, that is, is not the issue. The issue is how, what are the lessons learned yeah. for, 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 for this? That is not a debate. Sure. I mean, uh, Ukraine was a peaceful country. They were uh, violated and raped by their neighbor, uh, Russia. So that is uh, the only truth that exists. We draw the lessons that it is time for us to double our uh, investments in renewable energy, to see to that we have uh, renewable energy produced in Europe and we are not uh, uh, any more reliant on the aggressors. Uh, okay, the, the next issue is that um, just prior to the start of this interview, the World Health Organization published statistics that at least 15 million people have died of COVID-19 related issues. This is a pandemic which was not expected. How much are you going to inject in the health sector uh, to preempt such an occurrence, which was a health cataclysmic situation? Yes. And it affected Europe and the US especially hard uh, when it comes to the number of deaths. Uh, not least many elderly people with a weak uh, situation in health were badly affected by COVID. So for us, this is so important. First of all, vaccines. This is the most important innovation for many, many years. We now have vaccines 
everybody should take their vaccine. And that is what something we are advocating strongly in Europe, because that's the, the way of uh, avoiding getting killed by this disease. Secondly, we must strengthen the basic healthcare system. And I think that is a, a reality in Europe and in Africa. We must invest in health systems. Availability of uh, protective gear, availability of uh, nurses and doctors and uh, facilities where people really can get help. So I think we have a decade in front of us with uh, the need of many health, in health directed investments uh, both in Europe and in Africa. What do you think is the key priority which must be realized? For us uh, and for me, two things are highest on my agenda when it comes to developing the European Investment Bank. First of all, the Climate Bank. I think we are the world leader here. We must still go on to keep that position because we think we can be uh, sort of a, a good role model for many other banks on how ambitious you can be when it comes to climate-related investments. Secondly, EIB Global. We have now started our development finance arm, EIB Global, that I hope will grow and be prosperous in the way where, where we partner up with countries outside European Union, where we can really have a true partnership and make true investments that is good for sustainable development. And this is something that I am very engaged in. The Vice President of the European Investment Bank, Pumas Upstrus, thank you very much indeed for being guest on Globe Watch. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Mr. Vice President.